God, we just love you so much. God, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you that your presence is with us in this place this morning, God. God, we, we, we haven't come here for blessings, God. Blessings are great. We thank you for them. We haven't come for that. We've come to just give you praise, to thank you for who you are and what you are to us, Lord. We just love you so much. We dedicate our lives to you. Help us to just be carriers of your presence wherever we go, whatever we do. Speak to us in a whole new way. God, we just love you so much. Amen. Amen. God's good, isn't he? Wow. Let's just show our appreciation to the band. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks to all the kids' team as well. Everyone's on holiday at the minute, so um, we're a little, uh, little low on the ground at the moment, so we thank you for the guys that are still stepping in the gap and doing that. Do I need to have a, have a microphone in my hand? Is that easier? Anyone? I'll just talk to myself for a bit, that's fine. Someone come and give me one if I need one, because I don't want uh, to squeak into... Do I have this? Is that all right? Which is best? This one? Okay, we'll go with that. Hello? There we go. Hey. You know, some of you then were thinking, oh, it's going to be great. I'm not going to be able to hear him for 30 minutes. That's brilliant. You haven't got away with it, have you? Okay. So everyone all right? Awesome. It's a little bit warm in here, isn't it? The air condition is on, I've been told, but I think um, only that can do so much, isn't it? So yeah, so I want to, before I bring um, God's word for you today, I just want to give you an update on something that's really, really exciting that's happened over the last several days. So does anyone want to hear anything that's exciting? Yes, yes. Right then, so Pastor Jackie and I, um, along with Jackie's mum Estelle, and we had two amazing youth leaders, Bex and Naomi, we accompanied a bunch of our youth uh, young people to Limitless Festival. So Limitless Festival is a national youth event which is organised by Elim. And that happened last week for five days. There was 3,800 young people, um, tiring, gathering together um, on Lincolnshire Showground and they were worshipping God and they were encountering God. So we camped out in a, in a huge field. Even, even Estelle did bless her. She's in her 70s and she camped with us as well. And we, we all gathered together as a church family, which was awesome. And uh, there was 400 volunteers and they were there to serve the young people, to enable them to have a good time and obviously encounter God as well. And Pastor Jackie, so her role, if a lot of you know Pastor Jackie, her role in the group was the mum of the group. And she was quite a good mum, wasn't she, guys? I can see some of you nodding who were there. She did a very good job of that. My role was cook, stroke, security guard. Okay, <laughs> security guard for our young people. Um, Bex and Naomi, I think Naomi is over there. Bex is out with the, with the youth. They did a, an amazing job of really just supporting the, the young people, praying with them, um, encouraging them, sort of after the meetings, just to have a, have a chat with them and, and see where they're at and what they've experienced. And uh, our mum Estelle, like I said, she's in her 70s. She was part of a team with 23 other people and they had, their main focus was to cover that entire place with intercessory prayer. 23 or 24 in total people walking around the crowd just praying. We call, um, we call mum uh, Estelle, we call her the prayer ninja because she walks around and she prays and no one knows that she's doing it. She comes from nowhere. And uh, she was praying for those that had accepted Christ, praying for people that wanted healing. You'll probably see in a couple of pictures, which should be on the screen uh, in a second, of the young people gathered in the main auditorium. 
So that was about two and a half people, two and a half thousand people gathering in the main auditorium, worshipping God together. Amazing, eh? I thought it was amazing anyway. And um, do you want to know the best news? This is the best news, okay? In the five days that we were there, there were 420 first-time decisions for Jesus. Amazing, eh? I thought that deserved a round of applause as well. So I just want to take um, uh, this opportunity to thank all those who, who gave up their time to, to serve during it. And I also want to uh, thank those people who actually financially contributed towards it. You know, we had a number of people that contacted the church and said, listen, I want to pay for one of our young people to go. Or I want to give some money to enable that to happen. And, and we couldn't have done it without those people. So just want to really appreciate those, those people. And we had a fantastic group of young people who represented our church. And they did represent us well. You'll see them there having a super time. They didn't have pizza every night, by the way, when you see the pizzas, they got fed properly. And a little bit of a story, me and Naomi, we got on the, we got on the bus on the first day and we met at 8 a.m. Me and Naomi were, were on the bus heading across and me and Naomi looked at each other and were like, they're all a bit quiet. They're not really talking to each other. We're a little bit nervous about that. Maybe it was eight o'clock in the morning. That's what it probably was. And the young ones not woke up, younger ones not woke up at that time. And uh, on the way back, we were travelling back. We left at about uh, 9.45 p.m., something like that, to head back to Northampton. And I said to the coach driver, I said, I said, I said it's gonna, this is going to be the easiest journey ever. I said, they've had late nights for the last five, five days. They've hardly had any sleep. And, uh, and we thought we were going to have a nice, gentle, gentle journey home. But guess what? They, they were all at the back of the coach. They were singing. They were dancing together. They were sharing how much they'd enjoyed it. And I'm sure we'll probably hear some, some more stories and testimonies over the coming weeks of that. However, it was very tiring. I've realised I'm not young anymore. And, uh, and uh, usually I can, I can have a tiring time and then the following day I'll, I'll go to sleep and have a long sleep and then I'm fine. But yeah, we got back on early hours of Thursday morning and, uh, and I'm still fear, feeling, the, um, feeling the tiredness of it. Um, and do you know what? I think it was worth it. Of course it was worth it. Even if there was one person who gave their life to Christ, the whole week was worth it. And what I did come to notice a little bit is these, these young people do get a bit of a bad rep, don't they, sometimes? You know, and we're easy to, to make judgments on that. But the young people of our church, and I'm not just saying this, right? It's, it's the honest truth. Those young people that we served during those five days were a credit to us. They were a credit to their, their parents, their carers, their families, but they were a credit to our church as well. And it was an amazing time. Um, there, was, there was one moment that really touched me where our young people actually took the time to, to pray for the leaders. And that, that really did touch me. They laid hands. You'll see a picture there laying hands on, on Jackie and, and praying for her. And it really um, showed the hearts of those incredible people that we served. And on the last day, uh, like I said, they had pizza on the last day, a bit of a treat. And uh, I got, I'm, I'm, I'm a Yorkshireman, so I like getting cheap. So I got buy one, get one free from Pizza Hut, okay? So we had a couple of pizzas left at the end. And uh, the guys, literally not even prompted, just gathered the pizzas together. And then they walked around the site, just sharing it, sharing it around people, the food that they got left. And it was just, just what, a, what an amazing time that we had together and amazing, amazing young people that we served. So before I start sharing with you, I just, I just want to pray. I think we should do that together. I want to pray for the young people across the site that accepted Jesus and started this journey of faith. I'd also like us to pray for the, for the young people of our church who attended and, all, and, and for all people, all young people in our church as well. Can we do that? And, and if I can ask you to, you know, consider, consistently pray for, for the young people in our church. They are the next generation, you know. And um, like I said, we're all, we're all going to disappear in the very near future, in the this, in this future. And we, we need the church to continue and these people to carry the message of Jesus. So we just want to support them. It's, it's tough. It is tough out there at the moment for our young people. So let's just pray for them, yeah? 
God, we just thank you so much for, for the young people that, that enter this church, Lord God. And we also thank you for the people, the 420 people that made decisions to follow you, God. What an exciting time in their journey of faith. And we just pray that they will, they will have people around them that can help them grow, that can help them develop, that can help them become the people that you want them to be, Lord Jesus. We also pray for the people in our church who attended that, the young people. We pray that whatever they took away, uh, whether it's an encounter from you or a word from you, God, that they can really help um, develop themselves in, in their faith and that we can be facilitators of that. I pray for all young people. I pray for people at the moment who are waiting for their exam results. I pray any anxiety, any fear will just be removed in Jesus' name and that you can just be someone that they can come to as a comforter, a friend, a companion, that they don't feel on their own, but they just develop such a strong faith in you that they can carry and give to other people as well. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Right, here's the bad news. You're going to listen to me talk for 20 minutes, okay? That was the good news. So then, let's get into God's Word. And um, you've probably figured out by now that we're going to be sharing communion together. So if you don't have a, a vessel, this is what I'm calling it. This is the new word. I'm calling it a vessel. If you don't have one of them, there should be one of our guys around you. Just put your hand up and one of our guys will, will bring one to you right now. And we'll, um, we'll share that a little bit later. But what, what I thought would be really good for us to do when we do this, because we don't do it um, as often as we'd like to, but what I'd, what I'd like us to do is just prov is to provide some space a little bit later for us all to be in God's presence um, and, when, and as we share communion together. So here's an interesting fact about communion, and I'm, I'm hoping that none of you know this. Here's an interesting fact. So most of us know who Neil Armstrong is, don't we? Yeah. We know Neil Armstrong is, just me, he's the first man on the moon, uh, apparently, but we won't get into that. Um, so he was the first man on the moon, one, one uh, small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, there was another astronaut with him called Buzz Aldrin, and he went with him. So when Apollo 11 landed on the moon on Sunday, July the 20th, 1969, Buzz Aldrin actually brought with him a tiny little communion kit, which was given to him by his local church. So after they did the whole thing on the cameras and that, and the cameras went off, it actually continued on the radio. And in radio silence, Buzz Aldrin took, had the first meal on the moon, which was communion. So when there was a radio blackout for privacy, he read from God's word and he read, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. And then he thanked God and he took communion. I think that's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, I think that's amazing. One word of knowledge today, guys, when we take communion, you haven't got to wear space suits today. So that's okay. So don't worry about that. So the title of my message today is Why Jesus Gave Thanks. So Jesus did give thanks, if you don't know that. He gave thanks to God numerous times in the Bible. And I'd like to ask you all a question today. How often and how do you give thanks to God? You know, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I asked um, our, our daughter, Bethy, uh, that exact question question, how often and how do you give thanks to God? And her answer was, well, I give, Daddy, I give thanks to God before we have a meal and I give thanks to God before I go to bed. And her prayer before our meal is always the same. She learnt it at school and she says, for food we eat, for friends we share, we thank you, Lord. Amen. I think that's quite cool, isn't it? Uh, there were some of these in there because she goes to um, Church of England. So we Pentecostalized it a little bit and modernised it. So saying thanks at mealtimes, I'm sure probably happens across a lot of people's tables, doesn't it? In the room and at home as well. We say thank you before we eat. And so we should. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. However, how much time do we spend in deep gratitude for all the blessings of God? And this is a serious question. You know, someone once said, we ought to have 364 days of thanksgiving and only one day to gripe and complain. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? And I'm sure that'd probably be a good intention, but not very realistic. 
And as believers in Jesus, we aim to model ourselves on Jesus and the teachings of him, don't we? So what occasions, I want us to explore today, what occasions or circumstances did Jesus actually give thanks to God? See, we as humans, we generally give thanks to God when, and and Pastor Jason and Linda have covered this over previous weeks, we generally give thanks to God when we receive something, when we receive a blessing or it's something tangible or something good that's happened in our lives. And we should, of course, be thankful for that. Don't get me wrong. And we're reminded of some sort of divine favour. Favour. We're reminded of something that's happened in the past. We were prompted to say thank you to God. And we've had this campaign, haven't we? Thankful over over the previous several months, uh, several months, several weeks, um, and that's helped us focus on the biblical basis of saying thank you to God. However, we're all human, aren't we? And I'm sure at times we've probably taking even the most important gifts from God for granted. And in this service today, we're going we're gonna to take communion together a little bit later. And communion is, it's an act. It's an act of remembrance, which was established to Jesus to assist us in remembering the incredible gift of grace that's been provided through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And see, without that sacrifice of Jesus, where would we be? I know where I'd be. I'd be pretty lost and I'd be pretty without hope. And since this gift is so life-changing and it's so significant, why did Jesus think it was necessary to create an ordinance of remembrance around this subject? See, Jesus did it because he knows us and he knows us better than we know ourselves. And he knows that we are human. And he knows how forgetful we can be. Even those people, including myself, who've received forgiveness, who've received grace and all those amazing things. See, I want to make something clear today. Our faith shouldn't be religious. See, our thankfulness shouldn't be out of habit or compulsion. And here at Elim Church, Northampton, we aren't logistically able. So if some of you are wondering, why don't we take it every week? We're just not logistically able to to take communion um, for that. But personally, and this is just my personal opinion, I feel it also prevents us from the habit of doing it religiously. So when we share communion today, we're going to provide time today. We're going to provide space to communicate with God. We're going to have time and space to give God the thanks that he deserves. And this is not going to be a thing out of compulsion, so you don't have to do it. But we want it to be a true heart moment. So, when did Jesus give thanks? We're going to to look at a few examples of that. What prompted Jesus to say thanks? So we're going to explore three quick scriptures together. Uh, So I'm not going to talk for ages, don't worry. We're going to have time and space to be able to take communion together. We've got three quick, quick scriptures. The first one is John 11, verse 41. And John's, in this moment, he's recollecting the events that happened during uh, Lazarus being raised from the dead. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. So why did Jesus thank God for hearing him? He thanked him because, because God heard him when he prayed. And that seems a little bit peculiar coming from the lips of Jesus, but it's such a revealing example of the nature of Christ. See, I, wanna, I want you to have a think about some trouble that you might have had in your life. Who was the best person to go to? I'll be honest with you, I've gone to some people that haven't helped me too much in the past. Is it someone that you would go to who doesn't listen or leave you in the lurch? No, you would want to go to someone who listens to you, wouldn't you? You'd want to go to someone who cares for you. You'd want to go to someone that's got your best interests at heart. You might even need a little bit of help in that situation. Maybe in an extreme scenario, you might need someone to act on your behalf. You know, prior to to being in the ministry world, um, I helped lead 
uh, and develop a, a number of recruitment and HR businesses over about 13 years. And one particular organization that I was part of grew rapidly. We were the fastest growing recruitment agency in the UK in, for two years running. And the main reason for that was that we, we listened to our clients. That was our ethos. That was our, our focus. So if a client was struggling with, with an issue or we could be recruiting someone or there was a, a HR dispute or something like that, they could pick up the phone, they could text, they could email. Uh, and they could get through to us. We couldn't resolve their issues all of the time, but we would hear, hear them, and it was a partnership for us to try and help them out. I, I, remember, a, I remember a particular example, and uh, I knew this client was going through a bad time. And uh, I was in the shower at 6 a.m. in the morning. The, 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 the workers used to go to be at work for 6 a.m. in the morning in Bridgewater, which is in Somerset, and I was in Sheffield. And this client was having this issue quite frequently. And I, and I knew I was having a shower in the morning, so I was about to drive for about three hours down to Bridgewater. So I left my phone at the side of the shower, and I could see it. And I was having a shower, and I could see the phone ringing. And at that moment, I thought, I've got to answer the phone. I've got to help him out. So I opened the door of the shower and leaned out the shower to answer the phone. And that customer still remembers that time when, uh, when, when I did that. And, and that was something that really made a big difference in the growth of our organization. They wanted someone to help them re resolve the problems. And they knew that we would also always answer the phone and hear them out. You know, before going to Limitless, there was a lot of, and Jackie's really good at this stuff, by the way, she's better than me, getting the forms filled in, getting them all on the Zoom calls and that kind of a thing. But the main form that we, that there was obviously permission forms, but the other form that was filled in was a medical form. And the reason that we filled in a medical form is for, is for them to end, uh, put any sort of pre-existing conditions on there that we needed to be aware of. And the most important question on that form is the emergency contact. Who do we call in the case of an emergency? And that is such an important part of the form to fill in. Because we need someone who represents them, who they trusted to make important decisions for them. Someone who knows them, someone who listens to them, someone that can have their best interests at heart in case there's an emergency. Thank God, by the way, there was no emergencies. We didn't have to call any of those numbers. There was a few, bit of, a couple of little heat exhaustions and nosebleeds, but apart from that, there was no emergencies. But that process needed to be there just in case. See, God listens. You know that today. God listens. He hears the prayers of his children. And we need to be thankful to God for his listening ear. See, Jesus, in the situation with Lazarus, he thanked God, didn't he, for that listening ear. And even just listening is a great gift and it's probably something that we need to be thankful for more. Thankful that God hears us. Thankful that God acts on our behalf. Thankful that God has our best interests at heart. And then what that does, or it should do, is gives us peace and confidence in those midst of crisis of life. So usually when these situations are overwhelming us, and we talked about people experiencing situations, normally when it's overwhelming us, it's because we've either not thanked God enough or we've lost the sight of God listening to our prayers and having our best interests at heart. You know, Jeremiah 33 verse 3 says, for all of us to call on him and he will answer us. Isaiah 59.1 tells us that God's ear is not too dull to hear our prayers. Thank God, that God, thank God that he hears us when we call on him, eh? He has told us, he's actually told us to boldly come to his throne of grace, for by his blood, the way has been opened for us to do so. He tells us to come to him because he's available and he hears our prayers. Here's a question for you. How long has it been since you thanked God for simply hearing your prayers? I'm not talking about answering your prayers. I'm talking about purely and simply hearing your prayers. 
If I wanted to speak to uh, Boris Johnson, I don't at the moment, he's probably got his hands full at the minute. But if I wanted to speak to Boris Johnson, could I just pick the phone up and say, hey Boris, my, uh, my road's closed at the minute, can you sort it out or whatever? I couldn't, couldn't I? I'd probably get through to a secretary or maybe a secretary of a secretary of a secretary. Here, let's hear some perspective. The creator of the universe is available for all of you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's crazy. It's crazy. He loves you. And here, let me tell you something else. He loves you not because you're absolutely lovable, even though you all are, okay? He doesn't love you because of that. But he loves you because his son created a path for you to go straight to his throne room. Jesus' body and blood was shed for you. And by following Jesus, you're cleansed and you're forgiven as well. So how thankful should we be for just that alone? Yeah? It might just be me this morning. I'm thankful for that. I hope you are too. Jesus was thankful because the Father heard him. And we should be thankful for that too. So I want us to move on to the second of our three scriptures together. Luke 9, verse 16. And this is the feeding of the five, 5,000. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. He then gave them to disciples to distribute to the people. I'm not going to spend too much on this verse because Pastor Jason, if you remember the analogy when he worked out in his house, how many at night, three o'clock in the morning, how long it took, how much bread had actually been needed and that kind of thing. I'm not going to focus on that because he did an amazing analogy of that. But I wanted to look at it as another way that Jesus actually thanked God. He thanked, his, he thanked God for the provision that he gave. And God regularly meets our needs, doesn't he? God is always giving. The air we breathe, the food we eat, the people that are around us, the house that we live in, the church that we live in, all comes from God. And this is definitely the type of thankfulness we do probably express most often, isn't it? But actually, do we give it a lot of thought? I think many of us in the Western world can take for granted some of the provisions that we have. Many of us have a tendency to focus on what we don't have. So we're asking God for what we don't have rather than giving him thanks for what we do have because we're so used to having the things that we need. I'm going to make a confession to you. It's bad it being on live stream, isn't it? Because uh, people can watch it back. But here's my confession. We were on the coach on the way home from Limitless and it was amazing. It was supposed to be a 90-minute journey home, okay? When I say amazing, I was being sarcastic. It was actually uh, a lot longer than that. And uh, Jackie and I had spent most of the day uh, packing. And uh, packing the gazebo. Richard, uh, if you're in the building, thank you. He came and helped us uh, to, to, to pack up the marquee and everything. Um, all the, uh, it was blazing sun. All the, adult, all the young people had gone into the, the tent to, to do the main meeting. So, and the coach came early, so I was loading up the coach with everyone's equipment. Being pale skinned in blazing hot sun. My sunburn had even got sunburn. Okay, it was that bad. And then I was, I was sleep deprived, I was sweaty, and in a physical sense, I was ready to go home. And uh, like I said, that 90 minute journey on the coach wasn't 90 minutes, was it guys? It was about, it was about an extra hour. So the, the parents and carers were waiting for an extra, an extra hour at church for when we got back. The A50 was an accident, we had to turn around. The M1 was closed. Plus, my darling daughter, eight years old, was getting a bit excited. She thought she was one of the youth for the week as well, by the way. She was at the back of the coach and she shouted down at the beginning, this is about 10.30 p.m., Daddy, can I have a Haribo? Right? So I thought a Haribo is a Haribo, which is one sweet, isn't it? She meant one packet. So about 20 minutes into the journey on the way back, I hear, Daddy, my stomach's hurting. <laughs> so I had to bring her down to sit at the side of me with a sick bucket just in case she threw up. And at that point, I started to feel a bit sorry for myself. And uh, we unloaded the coach. Uh, it was about uh, midnight, wasn't it? And then before we left, we gathered to pray together and I could just feel 
God sort of nudging me going, you're feeling sorry for yourself and these amazing things have happened. You know, we're given, we were given so much provision in that time and who am I to, to complain? So many big and little things he provides for us, eh? So many big and little things. Let me ask you today, do you passionately thank God for those little things? See, Jesus thanked God, the Father, for that little boy's lunch, didn't he? And look what, look what happened with that. So when we are thankful, and I don't mean, oh, thanks. When we are deeply thankful to God, God can do so much more with what we have. And Jesus gave thanks there, and he gave thanks for the Father's lavish hand. You know, one, one piece of, final piece of scripture I'd like us to visit today is Luke 22, verse 19. And we're going we're gonna to follow this passage when we share communion to, uh, today in a moment. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. See, Jesus met with the disciples in this, in this example for the last supper. He gave thanks for the bread and he gave thanks for the cup. And those emblems represented Jesus' body and they represented his blood. And Jesus at that point, just, just put it into perspective, Jesus at that point knew he was going to die. He knew at that point. He, was, he knew what was in store for him over those coming days. He knew he was going to die, but he gave thanks. I'm not sure I would do that. If I knew I was going to die, to get, I'd probably be thanking God, hoping I get to heaven, <laughs> maybe. But Jesus knew he was going to die and he was thanking God. Why did he do that? Why did he do that? See, Jesus was giving thanks for love. The love that God has prompted him to sacrifice his son. See, Jesus was reminding us that we are to be ever thankful for the love that God shows us through the cross. The love that he gave held Jesus on that cross. You know, God could have stopped any of that he could have stopped any of that if he wanted it. He could have sent an army of angels down and it would all been over and the sun had been out again and it would have been fine. But it was a huge sacrifice as God's love held him there. And Jesus, this is why, why, this is why it had to be Jesus. Jesus was a sinless man. The only sinless man to ever live. And he, he then had to carry all of our sins to demonstrate that we are forgiven. You know, sin has a cost. We know that. We don't talk about it as maybe as often as we should, but sin has a cost. The cross would have been completely unnecessary if it wasn't for our sin. But through the disobedience of Adam and through the disobedience of all of us, his children, we are sinners. See, many of us would probably admit that, wouldn't we? But do we really understand the cost of our sin without Jesus? Paul writes in Ephesians 2 verse 1 to 3, this is heavy, so prepare yourself. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, check this out, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That doesn't sound very good, does it? It's a, it's a heavy verse, but it basically means that, that our sin leads us to a separation from God and that's not a good place to be. But you know the good news the good news is that the love of God is the greatest gift the world has ever known. And I think someone needs to know this today. God is not a moral monster that wants to punish us. You know that, don't you? God's not a moral monster that wants to punish us. He's a father that's waiting for us with his hands open. And like I said about us being religious, religion will tell you that if you mess up, your father's going to punish you. 
Some of us, have, uh, some of our fathers, our real fathers, we were brought up in those environments, I'm sure. But true sonship, true sonship, our father tells us that if we mess up, we can call on our father for help and he'll be there for us. And if we accept him, it alters our path for the whole of eternity. John 3.16 reminds us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Let me say it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And we need to be thankful for that ultimate act of love. We must be thankful for being um, who he is. We we need to be thankful for God for who who he's been, who he is, and what he's yet to do. We are missing a key act if we fail to thank God. Just Just imagine what is waiting for all of those who understand deeply enough the love of God and the love of God that he has for us. And if we take time to truly, and I mean truly explore this in our hearts, not, not, not by compulsion, truly explore it, our automatic response will be to, thank, to be thankful. If we can fully, I mean, we'll never fully comprehend it, but if we can comprehend it the best that we can, all we'll want to be is thankful. So let's be thankful for Jesus, as Jesus was for God's loving heart. You know, many of us here do follow Jesus and trust him as our saviours. And by the law of averages, some people in this room do not. If you don't follow Jesus as your Lord and saviour, the the actual act of communion is not for you. That's not a religious thing. Nothing, if you you don't believe in Jesus and you take communion, nothing bad happens. You don't, um, we don't need to approve it. We haven't got a list of people that can take it and that can't. And you're not going to turn to dust as soon as you take it. But it simply just won't mean anything to you, will it? It won't mean anything. But here's the great news. The amazing news is that it could be. It could be meaning something to you. Right now, in this place, the love of God can, if you're willing, overflow your life. You can experience God's listening ear like we've talked about, God's lavish hand like we've talked about and his loving heart. He died for your sins and then he rose to to reassure you of eternal life that you can have if he wants to take his place, if you want want to, to take place as your heavenly father. So across this place, as as we frequently do, I'd like us to create some time and some space for for anyone that wants to respond to that. And I'm going to say a prayer to help you. It's not a a, a special prayer or anything like that. It's just easy to to articulate for for people that do want to make a decision. And church, if 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 you've already done that, that's fine. But if you can just help, help me with that by repeating after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Saviour. Amen. And for those who already follow Jesus, how thankful are you today? If God's nudging you right now, will you come to him before we, create, before we take communion together and passionately thank him for all he's done? Someone someone here today, I'm sure, is feeling prompted uh, to get themselves right with God. So what we're going to do is we're going to create some time, just a couple of minutes and some space. Johnny's going to play as he does so well. And we're just, we're not going to sing a song right now. We're not going to do anything. We're literally going to have a couple of minutes 
This is time. This is time. Just you and God. And not my Yorkshire accent. Just you and God. And then we'll share communion together. Is that okay? Great. Johnny, if you can play for us. He took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you want to fold, there's two bits of foil. There's a clear bit of foil which you should be able to get in. You pull that off and then you'll get the uh, wafer at the top. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. You should be able to pull the silver foil up now. God, we just thank you for your sacrifice of your son on that cross. God, we know that we don't remember that all of the time and sometimes take that for granted. But today we come 
with true thankfulness in our hearts. True thankfulness for everything you've done, what you're doing now and what you're going to do, God. God, just just help us to stay fixed on you. Help us to live the life that you want us to, to be and be the people that you want us to be. God, we just remember that cross. And as you sacrifice for us, help our lives to be a living sacrifice for you. In Jesus' name.